Alrighty, guys. The Norwegian method, lactate testing, etc. Hot topic at the moment. Uh, I'm going to give my thoughts on the whole thing. In particular, the lactate testing and, and monitoring in training as a measure of training intensity. Uh, okay, firstly, what's the Norwegian method? I still don't really know because it's not really defined. Uh, basically, it's the training methodology used by the professional Norwegian triathletes, in particular, uh, Christian Blumenfeld and Gustav Eden and their coach, Olaf. Everything they do is essentially bucketed as the Norwegian method. Three specific things that tends to come up around that is, in particular, the use of lactate as a training intensity measure. And then there's the, the data collection, just a huge amount of data they collect through sensors. And then also comes up as well in the triathlon community is the use of double threshold training days. So doing two threshold sessions on a single day. So I'm going to particularly go into the lactate measurement and training one. And then I'll just also possibly touch on double threshold days. And then the Norwegian method as a marketing term, which is kind of what it's turned into. And we'll, we'll, we'll d dive into that later in the video. Now, I just want to say, first off, I'm not some anti-technology, anti-measurement uh, kind of guy. I mean, I, I own a Lactate Pro uh, Lactate meter. I bought it probably seven years ago, and I actually don't know where it is. I'm pretty sure it's in the garage in storage somewhere because I haven't used it for that long. So I have used one. And I own one, putting that out there. I also have, I have a hemoglobin meter, so I can test my hemoglobin. So I'm not someone who's anti-measurement, uh, anti anti-data, or anything like that. Even some of the, the other measurements, like uh, heart rate variability, in my own training and in my practice as a coach, I, I, I spent all of, pretty much all of last year, 2022, with myself and with a small group of athletes I coach, taking morning heart rate variability readings for most of them at least six months. For me, it was about 12 months of taking those readings because there was, in theory, an application for heart rate variability use in particular. I tried it. I put the time in. My athletes, a group of my athletes put the time in. I came to the conclusion that in my coaching practice and in my own training, it actually wasn't very useful. It just wasn't good enough data and I now haven't used it. So I'm, I'm not sort of anti anything off the bat. I'm more of a, does it work? Does it improve the process of training and monitoring? Is it easy and sustainable to implement? Let's go for it. If it doesn't, if it doesn't improve the training process, I don't use it. So putting that out there. Now, lactate in particular, let's go. The whole premise around why you would use lactate as it appears from the stuff I've seen online about the Norwegian method is that you're using it to make sure when you're doing your lower intensity training in particular, that you're not going too hard. So on your endurance rides, on your aerobic rides, you're stopping, you're testing lactate to see what your lactate values is to make sure that you're not going above zone two. That's sort of how it's explained and how they're justifying its use and why they're recommending it. Now, I just disagree with that as a whole, that you necessarily need or that it's useful to track lactate to make sure you're not going too hard. When you're monitoring training, you have internal load and external load measures. Now, external load is the amount of work you're doing, so your power. Now, most of us have power meters on our bike. We can measure the external load. You can then measure the internal load, which is how hard your body is working to produce that external workload. So this is things like heart rate. This is things like effort level, RPE. It's a valid measure of internal load. And then you've got things like blood lactate that can also measure how hard your body's working to produce the power. Now, if I want to prescribe an aerobic endurance ride and make sure someone's not going too hard, it's not that difficult, okay? Start off. Most of us use a power meter, which is great. We can measure the external workload. So we can say your zone two is between X and Y watts if we're using the classic six zone model as a percent of FTP, right? And I can go to an athlete and I can say, okay, in your zone two, I want you to hold between 60 and 65% of FTP and you're going to be close. That's your zone two, right? That's your first step. Then to make sure they're not going too hard, you can then bring in RPE. So your effort level. Now we know zone two is a conversational pace. So you can say, look, I want you to train in your zone two power. Let's say 60 to 65% of FTP. Then you layer in the effort level, right? And you say, okay, I want you to train between 60 to 65% of FTP. 
But I also want you to just check in every every 10, 15 minutes and make sure that your RPE isn't going above a conversational pace. Let's call it a 4 out of 10 effort level. Max, 5 out of 10 effort level. And then you've got your first measure of your internal load to validate that the external load isn't too high. Because there's no point saying, go and write it 65% of FTP and their RPE is at a 7 out of 10. That's not zone 2. So you validate with the effort level. All right? What's the probably the next easiest thing to, to track? It's heart rate. Cool. So you, you ride to your zone 2 power. Then you're checking your effort level. And then what you can also do is check your heart rate. Okay, where's my heart rate sitting as a percent of FTP? Is this in zone 2? And that brings another level in. So if your power's in zone 2 and your RPE is in zone 2, chances are your heart rate's going to be in zone 2 as well. If it's not, you can then analyze that after the fact most likely and go and look at where was my heart rate sitting for those two things why was that was it hot how was my fueling how was my hydration was my hydration off was that causing the heart rate fluctuations and things like that right so you've basically got your measure of external load and already two very easy to get measures of your internal load so if you're telling me that you can't get a rider to train to do a three-hour endurance ride without going too hard combining power effort level and heart rate, I find that very hard to believe. So that's just the first thing. The idea that you need lactate to make sure an athlete's not training too hard, I don't agree with. I don't see that in practice. I don't see that in my own training or with the riders I coach. So my next point is that the whole premise that this is based on, this idea that if you train too hard, your lactate will be too high and your training won't be productive. I don't agree with that uh, as a principle in the first place. I mean, there's definitely riders that do their zone two too hard. And there's definitely a dec- uh, a detriment to not doing proper endurance training, proper zone two training when you're doing high enough volume. But that comes out in the wash. And this is my point. You've got an athlete or, or a rider that's doing their zone two training too hard because they're not monitoring it, monitoring it properly. Okay, well, firstly, that's not ruining someone's aerobic gains. You're not ruining your aerobic gains just because you're your zone two is actually tempo. What's going to happen is you're going to get symptoms of overtraining quicker. You're going to fatigue way too much throughout the week. And you're not going to be able to get the the training load and the training volume targets that you set in the first place. So as a coach, if I have an athlete who is for a short period of time, even a couple of weeks, doing their endurance rides too hard, I'm going to spot that anyway. I can then look at their power, look at their heart rate, ask them their effort level, you know, those three measures I already talked about. And I'll be able to then recommend that they drop their power, let's say, for example, or drop their effort level in their endurance rides. And I'll pick that up usually within one to two weeks anyway. So what that means and what I'm kind of saying there is that just because you're not monitoring your training intensity with lactate doesn't mean you're just going to go on for months and months doing all your endurance rides at tempo, right? Which is kind of what they're getting at. I just, I don't see that happening in practice. I don't, with all the riders I coach and have coached over the years, I, I haven't really seen that happening because with a good coach, they can spot this. Or with an athlete who's monitoring their own training, they should also be able to spot this relatively easily. I'll leave that there. Now, let's say you don't care about any of what I just said. You said, Jesse, I want to measure lactate. All right, I just want to. I believe in it. Okay, fair enough. The thing you got to understand is that it's not a Goldilocks measurement. And IQ did a very good article on this explaining sort of the downfalls of lactate measurement. And there's, there's multiple of them. First one being, well, it's cumbersome because you've got an expensive lactate meter you're then taking out on the road. You're then having to stop your ride to to prick your finger to get the blood measurement. And then you're taking your lactate test. So it's inconvenient, firstly. Also, you can only do that at that point in time that you've stopped. It's not a continuous measurement like heart rate is. The other thing as well is there's error in these devices. Because when you're testing lactate, you might say, okay, I want to be sitting between 2.2. 2.2 and 2.6 millimole of lactate. But there's error in this device. Like if you take a, a lactate measurement and it says 2.4, it might actually be at 2.8 or it actually might be at 1.9, especially when you're out on the road doing a fingerprint measurement with a sweaty hand on your own. Even if you wanted to use lactate on your own, I'm just not convinced that the readings you're going to get in the field are going to be accurate enough at a level where you would be adjusting your training to. The other thing as well, to add on top of that, even best case scenario, let's say you are really good at taking measurements and you've got the Lactate Pro 2 and it's relatively accurate. Let's let's say best case scenario then. Even the lactate levels 
for day to day fluctuate just like heart rate does. Now, potentially not as much as heart rate, but things like uh, your recovery, your diet, you know, if you're glycogen depleted and your fat oxidation is higher on a day, your lactate levels will be lower. If you're carbed up, lactate levels will be slightly higher. Uh, if you're fatigued, if you're tired, lactate levels aren't this Goldilocks stable measurements, which people might think they are based on how they're reported. They fluctuate day to day, just like pretty much every other measure of internal load, like heart rate and RPE fluctuate. So in that way, it's not better than the other internal load measurements, which are also subject to fluctuations. So is lactate and people need to remember that. I will say if I was going to use lactate for any purpose in my own training or, or, or coaching, I would probably use it more for uh, testing as opposed to prescribing training intensity. So you want to track someone's improvement in fitness. Yes, you can go do performance-based measures, maximal effort testing, but it's quite intrusive to training. It's quite stressful. And it also doesn't necessarily track improvements at sub-maximal efficiency and improvement in your uh, zone two ability, zone three ability, and those sorts of things. So what you would generally use lactate more for would be doing a, a sub-maximal ramp taste. Let, let, let's test lactate levels at zone two, zone three, lower zone four. Run through a sub-maximal ramp test, take lactate values, retest in eight weeks, retest in 16 weeks, and let's track how power output has improved at two millimole of lactate. Or what's your lactate? How is your lactate levels changed when you're riding at 250 watts? Again, as I said, that is subject to fluctuations, which you're gonna have to tr work hard to to stabilize. You know, m uh, going in with the same level of fatigue, going in with the same level of hydration, going in with the same level of carbohydrate store glycogen storage the day before uh, going into that test. So again, <laughs> that's not a perfect solution either. But I I definitely think there is more use in using lactate measure to to test progress as opposed to using it to to um, track uh, training intensity which i don't feel like is necessary at all now next thing that this double days the double threshold days let's get into that so uh is there something special about doing double threshold uh days uh i don't know why i get it got asked this quite a bit um first thing no i i don't know many athletes that require that level of load to improve. So let's just, again, let's step back higher level. You're a rider. Uh, you're an enthusiast. Okay, you want to improve. What do you do? You're currently doing three training rides a week. You increase that to four training rides a week. Over time, you increase that to five training rides per week. You're increasing the load. You're progressively overloading. You get fitter, okay? Suddenly then, you're an elite, an elite athlete. You probably, you might be training seven days a week, right? And you're increasing that. And you're still able to achieve that overload in terms of volume, intensity, and training load by just doing one session a day. Eventually, in some extremely elite athletes, they're not going to be able to achieve their desired amount of overload by just doing one session a day, particularly with intense work. Because the amount of threshold work that a Christian Blumenfeld needs to do in a, a build period of his training to get the desired overload is going to be insane. You know, even if it's a bike workout, I'd have to guess, but he's he might be aiming for 90 to 120 minutes in zone four, you know, if possibly even more to achieve the desired level of stimulus he needs to, to improve his fitness because he's at such a high level. And it gets to the point where that just is so fatiguing, so difficult to fuel, so difficult to recover from that he's better off splitting that zone four work into a morning and evening session and then being able to lift the quality of each individual session and then across that day as a whole he's getting the same amount of zone four work done but because he split it in half it's a higher quality and then again from an injury point of view it's even way more important when you're talking about running because then you've got the impact of the running and is it even possible to do that amount of threshold work in one session without risking injury? I'm not a triathlon coach. I have some background in it through my degree. That's where you start to go high chance of injury. We're going to split that session up. From my experience, looking at uh, prescribing cycling training, doing my own elite level of cycling training, and also seeing a lot of professionals training, at least in road cycling, I don't know many if any, 
that intentionally do double intense workout days. It seems to be much bigger in the triathlon community, I think mostly because of the the uh, the the impact that swimming uh sorry that ru- that running has and then the, the muscular the, the load that swimming has it's just not a thing in cycling the only times where double days would be used essentially is for just a time management point of view you've only got two hours in the morning two hours in the evening you need to get four hours of work done that day four hours of uh, bike time done that day you split it up or potentially as well Um, to improve the quality of a session. So I'll I'll do double days if I have a race in the evening, but I need to get four hours done that day to get the volume hit. Well, I'm not going to go and do three hours of endurance and then a race in the fourth hour of that ride because the quality of that race is going to be terrible. So I might go and do uh, two and a half hours of endurance in the morning and then warm up race for about, that might be an hour and a half session. And then I've got my four hours for the day and the quality of that race has also been maintained. So there's logistical reasons why you might use a double training day. I don't see it prescribed um, by many, if any, road cycling coaches directly for a purpose of getting more uh, quality out of a threshold training day, for example. Just with the the low load of cycling and just, the amount of time you need at threshold to see uh, to get the adequate stimulus and, and improve is just not necessary for many, if any, athletes in my experience. So the Norwegian method then, why am I saying this is a marketing term? Okay, we go on YouTube, we type in the Norwegian method. The two biggest videos that come up are uploaded in a channel called Santara Tech. And Santara Tech is a marketing and branding company part-owned and run by Christian Blumenfeld, Gustav Eden and their coach, Olaf. And what this Santara Tech company does is take money from core temp sensors, VO2 Master, Moxie, Morton, etc. to advertise their product. So Santara Tech is essentially selling advertising space on these professional athletes and then producing content around that to make people want to buy the, the sensors. That's just how it works. And it's, it's, it's a great business model it's great marketing. And I'm not saying that that these guys and their coach aren't doing unique things in their training monitoring. They are incredible athletes. They're achieving incredible things. And they're obviously do, having these unique approaches, which some of them are working. But it's also in their financial interest to make sure that you and I think that the majority of the reason why they're going so fast is because they have a gazillion sensors all over them. That's He's built an entire company on that fact being true and that they're going to be able to promote it. So we need to keep that in mind. If you're watching any of these Norwegian method videos that are coming from the Norwegian camp in particular, they're there designed to sell us sports tech devices. It's a whole company that's there doing that. And so we need to just anything that's in any of these videos uploaded by Centara Tech or the Norwegian camp, a massive grain of salt because they're all, all they're doing is trying to sell us the devices. If you actually want to know more about what the Norwegian method is and how they're actually training, listen to their long-form podcast. The, the ones Rich Roll has done with, with their coach and w- with the athletes themselves are really good. Go and look them up where they sit down for an hour and a half and they're talking more about their actual training and what they're actually doing and not just selling products. And you'll start to get more of an insight into how they're actually training and not just essentially pumping up some analytics and some data monitoring sort of things, which is what... They would like us to think the Norwegian method is because it makes us more inclined to buy a moxie muscle oxygen saturation sensor. So please keep that in mind when we're seeing a lot of this Norwegian method content. That's it for this video, guys. Thanks for watching. Catch you in the next one.